Hi, and welcome to Fantasy Chat. I'm delighted today to bring you Lou Anders, who has written for Star Wars and for RPGs of his own making and all sorts of wonderful fantasy and genre specialties. So welcome, Lou. Glad to be here. I'm glad to have you. I'm going to go over your bio from your website, Lou Anders. You are the author of the novel Once Upon a Unicorn, as well as the Thrones and Bones trilogy, which I have. The first is Frostborn. And these are middle grade fantasy mm -hmm. books, fantasy adventure, high, high fantasy, you know, epic fantasy with frost giants and trolls and all manner of wonderful beings and people as well and the interactions between them all. They're a lot of fun. I really enjoy mm -hmm. Frostborn a lot. I am working my way through the rest of the series. So you founded Lazy Wolf Studios to publish your role-playing game books, The Thrones and Bones Norengard campaign setting. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. And you've done role-playing game design for Cobalt Press, River Horse, and 3D printed tabletop. In 2016, you were named a Thurber House writer in residence and spent a month in Columbia, Columbus, Ohio, teaching, writing, and living in a haunted house. In Goals. a haunted house. In, 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 in communist Ohio, you said? Um, in a, in Columbus, a, no. Yeah, I know, in, a, in a haunted house. It was interesting. Uh, who, who doesn't want to live in a haunted house well i mean I'm, i didn't want to live in a haunted house but it came with, with the with the, with the <laughs> honor so <laughs> um i feel like the house i rented in tennessee a couple of years ago was haunted but you know that's well just, i don't actually believe in ghosts so i don't either but I, there was something I, uh, in the attic probably squirrels <laughs> well this was a, a house that was um uh, it's it's the thurber house for the famous author and they've restored it to to what it looked like when he lived there a hundred years ago and it's a four-story you know old wooden house and uh it's 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 uh everything all the you know it's, it's a museum yeah all the furniture is ancient his ancient typewriter is in there and it creaks and yeah. there's nothing about it it's, it's not in a it's not in a, in, a, in a particularly lively district in Columbus. There's, you know, there's nothing but businesses around. There's no restaurants around. There's no nightlife. There's no ha homes. And so at night, it's pitch black outside. And it's dead silent. And the house creaks like crazy. Yeah. And uh, and then the, the upstairs is a converted attic, which is now an apartment for the writers in residence. And when I was there, it was modern. If like 1970s was your idea of modern. Um, yeah. I think they've redone it after i left but uh so i made sure to always be there before it got dark and because uh, there was no way i was gonna come home from being out and walk through three stories of this ancient house that's supposed to have a ghost in it to get to <laughs> my room and as the sun set i would like retreat further and further deeper into the upstairs closing doors and windows but uh but i don't believe in ghosts <laughs> but just in case yeah, just in yeah. case. Yeah. So, only, only, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say only one minor poltergeist activity. Only minor? Yeah. Symmetrical book stacking? Uh, no, uh, the Bath and Mirror pulsated once. Oh, okay. I was singing Cat People by David Bowie, and I, <laughs> I, can't, I can't carry a tune. I know it. The ghost didn't have to point but that somebody out. Somebody was grooving. But, uh, the, the, I don't, I think it was a, I think it was a, a harsh critique, but the mirror <laughs> in the bathroom just shot out bulged out like boom once and there's nothing on the back of it there's a hallway on the back of it so there's not like a pipe or anything yeah. whole mirror is just like that and uh so i stopped singing that song <laughs> probably a good idea yeah. <laughs> okay so this is all a really good preface for digging into your love for fantasy and speculative fiction in general so when did you know that you wanted to write fantasy Ooh, that's a big question. Um, I mean, it, it, it's 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 because it was a long journey, and I don't know how much ever you want. I, I still. It's up, to you. it's up to you. Well, I, I, you know, I, I, um, I started out actually in theater. I, I, I studied theater in Virginia, and then a little bit in London and Oxford, and then I did really, really bad. Thank God, no one had <laughs> cell phones with cameras back then. Uh, late night theater in Chicago for two years and it was it was really really bad and uh 
and then although while there I directed um my mind's drawing a blank uh uh played General Zod in the Superman movies um Boardwalk Empire I can't Mike Michael Michael Shannon oh Michael Shannon um, yeah I directed him in a really stupid late night improv sort of thing where he played a, a bionic man and uh had a bionic fight so I actually directed him in his first superhero battle way before awesome man of steel that's pretty cool um, I used to sleep on my couch but uh <laughs> but I I from there I moved to Los Angeles and I worked in Hollywood for five years and I, I wrote scripts with a partner when I was out there and uh did not have anything made but had a few things optioned and I also worked as a journalist and spent a lot of time on the set of shows like Star Trek Voyager, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and Babylon 5. Awesome. And uh, then I left that and got into editing and edited for 15 years in adult science fiction and fantasy. And uh, the whole time I wanted to get back to um, writing in some capacity and was kind of, uh, after a few failed attempts at writing uh, adult material, I, I I started writing children's material and then sold my first novel in 2013 and that was Frostborn. Yeah. So it's been, a, you know, it's been there the whole time. It's been there for years, decades. Fantastic. So who would you say were some of your greatest influences and in, in, it could be books, films, or just any sort of writing? Well, it, it, it's funny because I don't, um, when I read my stuff, I see Edgar Rice Burroughs and 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 Michael Moorcock and Ian Fleming all over it. And it's really funny to me because two of those three I haven't read since I was 15 <laughs> and uh, and probably wouldn't like if I read now because of right. so many really problematic elements. Um Mike, I've worked with. I was fortunate enough to actually publish stuff by him about three or four times. Great. And I recently went back and started reading the Elric stories again. First time since I was 15. And I was terrified that they would not uh, hold up like so many things. And I'm really relieved that they do. Yeah, they do. Those, those are huge influences. And then I bring a lot from the Hollywood background. Yeah, and, I can um, see that. Yeah. So are there any, like, what were your favorite when you were a kid? Like when we were kids, you know, what was your like favorite fantasy movie or set of movies? Well, was, when I was a kid, it was the animated Lord of the Rings film. Oh, wasn't it great? That was, yeah. And then and then John Borman's Excalibur. Dude, which I, I literally was just talking about Excalibur to my kids. This oh, wow. and said it's time to show you Excalibur. So because it's one of my all time favorite movies and I can't believe they haven't seen it yet. Because that was I saw that when I was probably too young, but um. I loved it so much and it stuck with me the whole time. Oh my God, Merlin. Mm, Nicole Williams. Yep, yep. Oh. It, uh, it, that, Helen it, Mirren. Patrick Stewart. Yep, yep. Liam Neeson, they're all in there. They're all in there. And 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 it, 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 uh, and, and sadly, like the only one who didn't really have a career is Arthur. Um, but, uh, <laughs> it, and he was great. It, yeah. I, I don't remember how old I was when I came out, but I was way too young to was be there. Early, it was like, when was it, like 80, 81, something like that. Yeah, really early and, 80s. And one of my teachers was there too. And I went <gasps> to a fundamentalist church school. Oh my God. And after class the next day, she asked me to stay after class. And I thought, I am, I am sunk. I am, I am in so much trouble. And it turns out she was really worried that I was going to tell somebody she had been there. <laughs> and so we talked about the film and we agreed we agreed that the sex was not gratuitous that it was necessary for plot yeah, and was. that we would not mention that we had been there to anyone <laughs> secret confessions of lou yeah. andrews that's uh, hilarious i love that story that's the best excalibur story i've heard yet so brilliant but um well that's fantastic so like you have this really interesting background especially regarding working hollywood and things like that but how how much of all your career background would you say kind of has woven itself into your writing? Uh, I think a lot of it. I um, when I was when I was in Chicago, I met a man named Dan Decker, who had just studied like the top one hundred grossing films, and distilled his own theory of how to plot story. Yeah, and uh, he was teaching someone else's writing workshop. Didn't like it. Made his own workshop. 
asked me to take it since I'd taken the previous workshop. And then I was kind of with him while he was developing his ideas. Like he wrote a book that I don't actually, uh, I read it, but I read it after all this. And so it's not big in my brain pan. Okay. But I was with him for years while he was developing his ideas. And he used to be, he, he used to be, he was based in Chicago and he used to be flown out to Los Angeles to teach development execs how to plot stories. And he later left and went into theater, but, um, but he was my mentor. And so he got me excited and that's why I moved to LA. And then when I, in 2000, I ended up working in the dot com industry on a, what was an online book space called uh Bookface, which uh, we should have, if we just, flipped those two nouns i'd be a trillionaire now but we weren't we were book face not facebook and uh Life and, is weird, huh? yeah that only lasted a year but when it ended i knew tons of people in the science fiction community because we had been working with them That's to get cool. their, their books in this proto ebook thing and uh and so i started editing uh first freelance anthologies and then for pyre books and long time after that like maybe 2000 Eight two thousand ten, I think it was two. It was Worldcon in Denver, so it might have been two thousand ten. I was in a, a a suite and I was talking to Paolo Bacigalupi and Mary Robinette Kowal, awesome. and they asked me about my theories about plotting screenplays, and I started describing it. And one of them went, "Wow, I do this without knowing," and the other said, "I don't do this, and you just fix the problem with my current work." Oh, project. that's great. So I started teaching screenwriting plotting to writers. Not I'm not teaching screenwriting because I don't have a movie with my own I can point to and said that's my movie, you right. know. But I'm teaching novelists how to plot using screenplay techniques. And so I started doing that. And it people started calling me back up and saying I'd never sold anything until I took this and now I'm selling my books. And I had some uh, pretty high profile editors in Science Fiction Fantasy come up and say this is fantastic. You should be charging a lot more for this than, you know. So I wasn't charging anything. Um, and after a while, I'm like, wow, maybe I should be using this. <laughs> and then uh, and then right? Muppets Most Wanted came out. And you know, Kermit, I got a lot in common with Kermit. Kermit grew up in the South. Yep. He had a dream of being an entertainer. He goes all the way out to California. I grew up in Alabama. I grew up in Tennessee. Cruise people so along the like way. That. Yeah. He, he struggles with self-doubt and I think mild depression. And, uh, but he always comes back to the source of his creativity whenever he, he loses his, his, his faith. And, uh, you know, but he ends up being the CEO of the Muppet show. Right. And, or whatever they, the, 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 the host of the Muppet show. And so the, it's all about putting other Muppets on and covered himself yes. is back in the office, you know? And I was starting to feel like, you know, I'm Kermit now. I was going to be a writer and now I'm an editor. And I'm I'm I, I, I'm very happy about that part of my life. And I made a lot of people's dreams come true by turning people into writers. But I'm like, I haven't done it for myself in 15 years. I think I'm right uh, at the point that you have been at where I'm just like, I'm ready to lift other voices. I'm ready to be Kermit. It's not easy. And, to, uh, you know. well, Kermit then stars in Muppets Most Wanted. And Muppets Most Wanted is the first Muppet movie that stars Kermit in a long time, maybe since Muppet Caper. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm like, ah, if Kermit can get back in front of the camera and let himself be the center of attention again, then I can too. And uh, I started writing books. And because everybody I knew was a a fantastic adult fantasy writer, uh, I, I was like, uh, you know, right now I'm their editor. I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the other side of the table. If I get on their side of the table they're gonna judge me so i picked and i also had small children so I, I picked children's fiction as something i could write for my kids that was not yeah in direct competition with what was still my day job and um and i wrote two um manuscripts that the first one just went out and sunk the second one was science fiction middle grade which and you know doesn't exist space-based science fiction middle grade does not exist yeah and, i just was having that conversation with someone the other day yeah. It, I mean, there's a couple examples, but no, it doesn't exist. Really not there. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I wrote something that was kind of an homage. It was like a young girl who lives on a space station where her father's the captain. It was an homage to my time on Deep Space Nine. That's and, awesome. uh, and it went out and all, we got so many responses and they were all, this is incredible. This reminds me of all my favorite TV shows. This is just fantastic. Of course, we couldn't publish this. 
<laughs> of course, we won't touch it, but it's wonderful. But we couldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Yeah, I know that. So I was like, you know, after this, I'm going to write what I want to write. And I, I wanted to write a, a kind of sword and sorcery adventure that reminded me of the stuff I read when I was 12. But I wanted to write it for modern 12-year-olds. Not, yeah. you know, and, and like, you know, do things like not be horribly sexist and racist and have female protagonists, things like that. You know, I used to tell people it's the Hobbit if there were actual any women in it at all. Yeah, which um great. <laughs> yeah. And uh there's a there's a there's a Robert Howard story called The Frost Giant's Daughter. And it's it's ah. it's a it's a problematic but interesting story where Conan wakes up on a battlefield and he everyone else is dead and he is dying. And he sees a beautiful woman and she seduces him or she she tempts him and runs and he chases her. And then her two brothers who are frost giants appear and attack Conan and he kills them both. And she calls out to Ymir, the god of the frost giants, to save her. And she's taken up into frost giant heaven and Conan is left clutching her clothing. And okay. it's they, Howard was trying to do a kind of Leda and the Swan thing with Zeus. In a, in a Conan story, and it he did capture the mythic kind of ethereal encounter, but it's 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 you know it's 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 extremely problematic from an adult perspective. As a child perspective, I wasn't aware of any of that. I was just like, why is she normal size and her brothers are giants? That makes no sense. Yeah, and so I was worrying on that, and I was like. I want to write a story that's like a Conan story, but stars a woman. What if she's a half giant? Yeah. And that's where Theana was born. And that I wrote awesome. a, I wrote a short story about her as an adult and sent it off and it sunk like a lead balloon. And then I realized that the interesting thing about her was not her as an adult. It was growing up as a half-sized giant. Yeah. And that's where the, the novel came from. Uh, and it's such a great novel and such a great concept of, you know, two very different kids becoming pals, you know, under extraordinary circumstances. And it's such a great backdrop for for everybody, really, but for especially kids who feel, you know, like they don't know where they belong. They don't know where they fit. Maybe maybe they're new in town or maybe they just seem different from the rest of their friends. And I really thought if I had had this book as a kid, it would have really helped me a lot. It's I had, thank you. I had a, I have, I have a friend who's over six feet tall and she told me, she's like, I love reading about a girl who doesn't slouch, a tall girl who doesn't slouch. She's and proud. Then, she's proud. Yeah. And, and, and I was at a school. I, I used to do a lot of school visits. I don't do them anymore, but I used to do tons. And a girl came up to me clutching the book and she said, I am the smallest person in my class and I am Theana. And, uh, and so I, 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 that both of those statements meant a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. that's really gratifying. I also love that. it when I get boys who, who read the book and love it. I, I say, there's, there's a male character too, of course. Right. When I get a boy child reader who says Theana is his favorite character. That, I love that oh, too. That's great. That's really cool. I mean, you know, it's it's all about the character and the story. So, you know, she's she's got a gripping story and and her legacy is, you know, unique. Speaks to a lot of a lot of that, you know, especially when you're entering your young teens, so much turbulence. So mm -hmm. I think it was it's just really a wonderful middle grade set of novels there. But mm -hmm. you know, you've built these books, you've built role-playing games, and so you've built entire worlds, you know, Norngard is this expansive, wonderful sort of Nordic mythology laced realm. And I have to ask, you know, I know this is kind of a, probably a long answer, but I am curious, how do you approach world building in your books? Well, it, it, and, and, and also Norngard is just one country. Right. Of just, it's, it's a realm. It's an entire. And we're going into some of the others soon, but uh, it, it, you know, when I started, I confess, I, I, I didn't know whether I could write a fantasy novel. And so I thought I would pick this kind of snowbound northern land on the edge of my territory. And I would write a story there. And if it worked, I would keep writing and the characters would move out, which they do and go to other countries. Yeah. 
and and I didn't know that much about the Vikings when I started, and and I I I realized I needed to know the people before I could write the story, and this is not advice. I in fact, this is the opposite of what most people will tell you, but I realized for me. I had to do serious, serious world building before I could even think about character. Yeah. And, and um, one of the things I did, and you know, I, I got a program called, uh, uh, it was a campaign cartographers, Terraform 3, I think it's called, and made a, a map. And it's this great program. It only works on Windows, so I run a clone for it. But it's this great program where you can generate maps and then go in and massage them. So you generate like 50 and then you pick the one you like, and then you can go in and mouse over and sink continents and raise oh. mountains and add increase or decrease rainfall and shape the coasts. And, and I did that for ages until I found a shape of a world I wanted. And, uh, and then I zoomed in on the place and I, I, I did something which I still do sometimes, which is I just, I, I wanted to make sure in, in, in world building, that I didn't have like uh, you know a country that was absolutely devastated one year and then was a superpower three years later, if that's not plausible, if that can't happen. So I'll take the actual history of a place. In this case, I took like Scandinavia up till 1450 and go in and pick out all the major events in their history and change that to my people's and then add the magic in. So, you know, maybe this battle was against the dragon and not the English, you know, or something. Right. And and that way I'll get a history and, you know, and it, it, I'll get a history that ebbs and flows like a real history. You know, if there's a famine one year and then something else happens, then a war happens the next, it's, there's a connection there because there's a connection there. And yeah. I haven't stuck things in without thinking about whether they would impact each other or how they would interrelate. And, uh, and and every time I hit a place where the Vikings invaded someone else, I ended up pausing and making a new culture. Hmm. And uh, interesting, you know. And they went to Constantinople. They fought with the French. They sacked England. They went. And they they fought. They, fought. they went around. They were they went around. To, to North America. They fought Native <laughs> America to North America. And uh, it it they went everywhere. They went to the yeah. freaking food. So I I uh, end up creating like forty cultures before That's I amazing. even started writing, and I had and for the nearest ones and some of the other ones just for because why not? I had gods, I had their own histories, right. I had naming conventions, I had I had um, you know just tons of information, and around that time I was still editing, and I I started to notice that. The writers that I worked with who also wrote for or played role-playing games were producing more fresh fantasy than the ones who didn't. Hmm. And so I started buying yeah. role-playing game books yeah. to read, you know, having mm -hmm. having not games in, in quite a few years. And uh and and these things kind of started intersecting. And I started realizing I am probably also creating a campaign setting as I write this book. And then for the second novel, we actually used the Fate RPG system, and I ran a game for two years in the location of the second novel, and Ooh. it and and it played back and forth the novel and the game as I was writing it. I didn't I didn't I didn't write my novel. You won't hear dice rolling, but I mean I didn't write my game up. But I used characters and events and established things about the world in the gaming that then fed back into the novel. I love this, and and I also do things like. For, for the for the for the first novel, you know, I sat through uh, the great courses lectures on Scandinavia, and it's uh, it was just this one professor in Tulane standing in front of a podium lecturing. It filmed it, no audience, no very few visual aids, just this guy in his tweed jacket standing at the podium. My wife comes in, she's like, oh, I was watching it every day at lunch. She's like, I'll, I'll I'll watch this with you, and she sat down. And she goes, Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and on the one hand it was dead boring on the other hand it was fascinating right but it was uh but it was a, like a was, science lecture which yeah, for, i think it was 15 hours i sat for that but at the same time i was also playing skyrim oh and, yeah uh, yeah and i got to um i got to travel to norway 
uh, after I'd written the first draft of the novel, before the novel came out, and I was worried that I was going to get there and and realize that I had not gotten the descriptions right, and I was going to have to rewrite my novel. And I took all these photographs and and I, I made all these notes and I got back to the novel. And I realized I had nailed the description. The, awesome. the only <laughs> thing I got wrong was that there are red berries in the summer all over the hillsides. And I oh, yeah. I One of those little details. Berries. Yeah. So I added the red berries and my editor cut them right back out. Um, whole trip to Norway wasted. But uh, no. But um, <laughs> No jam for you. But I, I was surprised that I had gotten it so well because Norway is such a unique landscape. You really did your research. And, well, I realized that I had played 100 hours of Skyrim at that point. Oh. <laughs> they had spent... They, million, they did the dollars. they yeah. were and boots it, on the ground. So for the second novel, the second novel takes place in a city a lot like Istanbul. A part of the novel takes place in a city that's modeled on Constantinople, right. Istanbul, at, at the fall. And Istanbul is famous for its impregnable walls, but there's a river that runs into the city from outside. It travels through two thirds of the city, and then it goes underground. And I could not find anything in history about any, any you know, I, I want to know what it looked like when it went underground. Did it, yeah. Was there a lake in the middle of the city? Was there a, a, a giant well? What What is it? And and so I got Assassin's Creed uh, <laughs> revelations and I walked from the gate where the water came through to the well. And it took oh about an hour just walking in the game and people trying to attack me. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm just I'm just. Just, just let here. me walk. Yep. And uh, and I, you know, I call my cartographer up. And I'm like, okay, this is what it looks like. It's actually a square building with a with a grate that the water pours through. You know, <laughs> this is fabulous. I love and, this. Um, so there's a there's a there's a, a there's a children's writer named John Alcier who's a great writer, and he wrote a book about chimney sweeps, and he had a really hard time because of the Blitz finding out about what the right. rooftops of London looked right. like in the 1890s. And I told him what I did, and so he went and got the Assassin's Creed game that lives in, that work that that's uh, that's in London, and, yeah. and based a lot of his description on walking the rooftops of Assassin's Creed. That's incredible. Yep. This is a really good method that right. fantasy writers could use, yep. and so I it's, 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 you know, many it's, do. But I mean, if you want to make it like it, it's it's doing the actual research, watching the lectures, reading the books, following up on the dry history. And then finding a way to immerse yourself in a similar yeah. environment from the perspective of being in it so that you internalize a lot of stuff without yeah. knowing internalizing it. That's fantastic advice. And and you did your due diligence across the board. So then you yeah. built that whole world, you know, with all these wonderful elements and you could be in it and know where you were. And now it all is making sense to me regarding the anthology that we'll talk about in a bit, you know, of how you shaped all this. So you took it from there. So you had the books and then you made a role-playing game and this role-playing game now has several manuals and all kinds of worlds to explore. And, you know, I came from when I, in the nineties, I got kind of into Dungeons and Dragons kind of late, you know, mm -hmm. I was already like in my late teens, early twenties and remarkably because I was such a fantasy nerd, but I I lived out in the country and I didn't know anybody who was into RPGs. So it wasn't until I kind of moved to the city and made friends, you know, in, at the new high school that I finally started to get into that. Right. I didn't have anybody to play with and we didn't have the internet because I couldn't do, I was by myself out and bouncing around the country. But like the minute I had access to that, I was like, God, I've been missing out on this wonderful situation where you can act out I was acting out stuff in the woods by myself with fake swords you know like but like here I had the opportunity to be immersed and so now that I've met you online you know and like you know we've worked on this anthology and I look at this wonderful game I'm just like I'm so impressed and delighted that you've come up with this magnificently realized universe that you can have offshoots of all kinds of things and novels and games and anthologies and wonderful tales and and I just want to say that I'm glad that you did because it's just it's fantastic and and you did it yourself like this was not under someone else's IP this is all you so I mean that's got to feel pretty gratifying it it uh thank you um yeah I mean mostly I'm just like amazed that it exists uh you know and it and it, oh, cool. it, it the um 
and it was I didn't intend for it to be this big. I had written four original novels that took place in five different locations. And uh, and then the Star Wars novel, and then um, because the second book they go to a, a country that's that's inspired by Switzerland, and then from there they go to a city state that's inspired by Constantinople as it's about to become Istanbul, and uh, and then the third novel goes to fantasy Greece, although it's um, I'm, I'm kind of proud of this. It's not it's not historical Greece and it's not Middle Ages Greece. It's uh because of the dynamics of the world. It's a it's a it's a Greece like it's a, it's first it's massive. It's way bigger than than our Greece, but also it's a it's a land that that has been conquered many many times, and then in modern history, they have gotten their hands on a power that's allowed them to retake their own continent and, um, and they've become isolationist and xenophobic and oppressive. Hmm. But the people in charge are now hearkening back to a classical period as a way to unify the country and have a sense of identity because they've been conquered from the left and the right for so many times that they don't have they they they, they don't have that. And so for cohesion, they're looking back at a at the classical Greek. So it's so it's a a a it, it, you know, my my technology level is about the 1400s. So it's like a high Middle Ages where there's this yeah. massive power that models itself on its classical roots and uh and um and then the fourth book once upon a unicorn is the youngest thing i've written it's still middle grade but it's definitely pitched more toward the eighth and the twelfth and uh it's um it's set on an island called the glistening isles where uh the fey realm has the fey can't come into our world anytime they like small fey can brownies and pixies can pop yeah. back and forth or stay but the bigger or more powerful the Fey is, the the more it's bound by rules and has to wait for doorways to open at the Equinox or Samhain or something like that. And and you know they hate that. They would love to be able to come and go as they please. And they've annexed a uh, a series of islands off the coast of a country called Ireland, which is Celtic land. And they've converted that to the Fey realm. So it's uh, physical islands on this world that are part of the. Fey. They've just they've just taken a portion of the world and made it theirs. Mm -hmm. And from there, they're always trying to get back in. Huh. And, and Once Upon a Unicorn is about unicorns and nightmares on that island, and it is you know written for kids. But I wanted it to be like there's only one human character in the book, and 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 uh, it he has an interaction with the fairy queen where she's like, come back to the castle. You know, didn't we always, and he's like, no, I don't think so. And she's like, well, didn't we always put you back together after we took you apart? And I want it to be like, if you know anything about the actual fairies of Ireland, yeah. you realize a human, not a unicorn could come to this Island and have a horrific experience. Not yeah. at all safe for eight year olds to read. Right. And that's one of the things I want to do in the games is take the player characters there one day. And it'll be awesome. very different. It'll be all the same things as the book, but from a very different perspective. Awesome. But uh, but the pandemic happened, and my father died at this at the start. Sorry. Um, as well. But I was writing a, an adult novel, another attempt, and totally lost the ability to write. Mm. And uh, so I thought I'll take a month and I'll do like a thirty-page supplement set in Norngard. And I'll, you know, just put it out on drive through RPG on this little 30 page pamphlet. Maybe it'll just be PDF only. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. And it, you know, became this big hardcover setting guide with like two starter adventures and all the mechanics and tons of content that went in the books. And, and, you know, now there's the setting guide, there's the Sagas of Norengard adventure book, there's Vengeance of the Vol Raven, which is the darkest thing I've ever done. Which is a, a, a standalone book length adventure, also set in Norengard, which is really dark. Um, there's a soundtrack. There's a Grammy nominated uh, composer named David Joseph Wesley, who's a Star Wars fan, who called me up and said he wanted to write music for me. And so My he, God, I didn't know that. Up, yeah, it's the Thrones of Bones soundtrack. It's on Bandcamp, and it's it's awesome. awesome. He he uh, got super into it, and he got in touch with a guy in Norway that made sound files that are um, actual Viking instruments. And also, uh, the guy took an actual axe out of a grave and an actual shield out of a grave. And then when you listen to the Thrones and Moans theme song, there's a sound of metal striking metal. Oh. A real axe striking a real shield. That's incredible. 
and it's like a thousand year old axe and shield and it's in the song absolutely and, awesome. um you know there's there's uh my friend andrew mills at milestone heroes is making 3d terrain that's modeled on the adventures in the books so that's amazing 3d he's done tons you can 3d print all the stuff and then play through the adventures and have it be what and i you know he asked me how's this supposed to look and so it's it's completely it, it, it is, is is accurate to what it is fantastic. And, uh, and then heroic maps are fantastic i've loved their maps for years and they've made i think they probably got like 70 maps now that are that, are, that they've done in partnership with me great for, i would love to for, talk to them because i've got yeah. I got my own needs in that regard too. Oh yeah. Well, they're they're they do battle maps. They're they do uh you know D and D battle maps, and then they'd be good for my dragon book. Yeah. They are my well, they're my favorite. I mean, we're talking about like dungeon room maps, interior room stuff. That's they're my they're my favorite battle map cartographer because they have so much detail on their maps, and awesome. uh, and then Rob Lazaretti is the guy who does the city and country maps. Okay. And Rob is well known in D and D circles. He's done a lot of work for. Okay both wizards and pathfinder and and he's good if you for country maps you know. i kind of need both but that's another yep. story oh cool <laughs> well i can put you in touch with both right on right on so, it. And, it. and there's a story behind rob too because like um when i was an editor we, we did a book with aaron hoffman now aaron hoffman johns and she goes well, i'll have a, i'll have uh the map for you in a few weeks and i'm like what do you mean you'll have the map for me we, we make the maps and she's like, no, no, I'm going to do my own map. And I said, no, we, we, we will pay for your map. And she goes, I don't want you to. Oh. I don't I don't want to be shown a map and told this is my map. I want to give you the map and know it's 100% what I want. And so she paid for her map. And I felt really guilty about that. <laughs> and the minute I sold my novel to Random House, I went, oh, my God, she's a genius. I got to make a map before they screw it up. And I cold called Rob Lazaretti because I loved his work and said, will you make a map with me? And uh, we've done tons of work together now, but he, and then when I was in Norway, I'm sorry, I'm so over the place. I was taking photos of Norway every day and then going back at night and emailing it to Rob, who was then adjusting the map he was working on based on the photos I was sending. Okay. Yep. Wow. That's, that's fantastic. I love hearing that process because mm -hmm. map making, I'm kind of obsessed with on a different level. At one point I was considering going in, this was back in the early 2000s. So I was considering becoming a cartographer and I took a course on GIS. So I was, because I have an ecology degree, I wanted at the time I was looking, I'm getting a little bit on ta off tangent, but I was oh, looking no. into making, I lived in Washington state and the wine regions were getting, starting to get notoriety there, Columbia Valley, Yakima Valley. And I wanted to make a map of potential wine appellations, you know, based on climate in all these different layers. And I, I ended up not pursuing that, but I had already made fantasy maps of my own. So it was kind of an offshoot of that. And that was just hand-drawn stuff like of a planet and various zooming in on the planet, the different continents, and then down to the city level and then down to the, the neighborhood level. And I just really, that was, that was too long ago. You know, I didn't have the tech for any of this stuff. So I'm listening to this now going, this is so fascinating to hear how this process came about to make the maps for your world so i love it it's just so when so you write do you, do you map after or do you map before or both, during both all of it um so the quest for Sun saga is science fiction and fantasy and for when i had first started writing those at age 13 and 14 i wrote two full-length novels i didn't get those published um but i stuck with those bones and i at the time made several illustrated maps of the planet Quopea, which is in Luminiferous, the final book of the now finished series. And then from there, the different, all the different continents on the world and the different mountain chains and the different lakes and, and various, you know, rifts and rift valleys and things like that. Um, so then I went from there and just, you know, I, I knew that they needed to be on this hidden world and they needed to, it was a world in which technology fails, except in only a few pockets. So if you're coming with a ship uh, into that atmosphere, you're not gonna make it unless that planet wants you to make it. And so there's only like a little window where any technology can function on that planet. And that is basically the only way in. It, it's a protective place. And most of the continents are sort of behind their own natural shield and they won't let anyone in. 
you know, the continents themselves won't let you in. So that's the planet Quopea and the Quo continents of, you know, there's, there's four of them that are that way. The other continents are, have isolated settlements. And so you have to figure out a way to get from one of the populated continents to one of the unpopulated ones to find something, this big secret, and that will help the galaxy fight the villain Peos Johan. So, you know, in order to do that, I needed it to be low tech. We needed a system for these characters to have to actually walk, mm -hmm. hike, sail, and not be able to fly, you know, at all by any natural means, uh, sorry, unnatural means and technological means to get to their final destination. So it's arduous, you know, you go from early on being out in space and having spaceships and things like that, and then having to be on this hidden world and being really restricted to what you could do. So the, the characters have to interact with the environment. So I could see, you know, looking back, I see now where my love for ecology comes into play because you have to interact with the environment and how does that work between living and non-living factors. And so I, I just started sort of building it all together. I was always illustrating my characters and then I started illustrating the maps and then I started illustrating structures like architectural diagrams mm -hmm. for some of those structures. And so it was all kind of together, building and growing together. And nowadays, like when I, I wrote the In at the Amethyst Lantern, which comes out later this year, and it's lunar punk, it's set in our future. I don't tell you where it is on earth. Something, some bad things have happened over the next hundred years, partly related to climate, others related to war. And you start to get hints of where this might almost be. But I, I made a map based on what I thought would happen under circumstances in the future, taking into account erosion and other factors, changing currents because of climate change and how that would affect erosion on this, like the Southern coast where this lighthouse sits and where it has sat for hundreds of years. But you know, you're getting this sort of intermix. So I'm always thinking in terms of how is everything fitting together and how is the environment affecting that land and how is that map going to change? And in fact, in the story, the kids get to see what it looked like long in our time. You know, they get a projection of sorts, a really interesting projection of what the land looked like. They're like, it looks totally different. Like that wasn't there. That's wait, what, what is this? You know, and so it's kind of helping you feel like you're immersed both in the past and the present. And I, it all kind of helps the characters to figure out their place in their own universe and how their journey has to happen and where they need to be and where do they see the clues that are on this sort of visual, you know, immersive map. And then the dragon book that I wrote, I, which is on submission now, fingers crossed, we get a publisher. Um, what candle do I need to light? But so regarding the map there, I knew that there needed to be seven countries, two of which actually eventually would form one republic. So then you have six countries. And I needed there to be, again, bringing ecology into it, I wanted to see how would prevailing winds affect different species, particularly on you know one side of the country versus the other, and orographic effect of rainfall. And so because there's a long valley, you know, very like the Central Valley of California, and you know all the dif the different environments, the different cultures that would have to adapt to those environments based on the landforms they, they have to deal with and cope with, like what crops can grow in different places and you know, how, how fortified are different areas naturally versus unnaturally and where is volcanism and where seismic activity coming into play that also was in the end at the Amethyst Center. So like, I, it's always kind of building together and I just draw it out. I draw it because I, I do art. I'm not like to the level of these map makers, but I can draw maps and I can draw features and I can get the general shape of the land and then move my characters throughout it. So that's kind of how I did it with those books. It's way off topic, but I could talk about maps all day long. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, you've already done this, but like uh, the, the, I referenced campaign cartographer, they'll let you build a world and then and then flood it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so so that totally see the erosion moving across. Right. And, or there's also other effects, you know, yeah. ex, extraterrestrial effects that can occur, like, a yeah. you know, a meteor strike and how does oh, they that do, shape they do, the they land? Do, they do that in camping yeah. cartography. Too. You can yeah, bombard it with that. asteroids. Well, then I need yeah. to use this. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I've already thought of it, but it'd be really fun to see it, right? Yeah. That's really... Well, the other thing, too, is you can... I want to see this land blow up. 
<laughs> you can export it the file into whatever um i'm like they should give me a, a commission here uh, totally. you, you should you can export the file into i forget the format but it's a format that google earth will read cool cool so the other thing i did is i exported my planet and then on google earth i, I put it in the round view and i turned on the uh the the country and state lines so even though it was my planet it superimposed over it that ah, work. i love and it that way i could look and be like you know this particular spot on this continent is where you know uh, france is on our world right so I know oh, what the climate cool. is i know what the climate is like i yeah. know where the snow line should be I know, you know because i'm just i'm not smart enough to work all this out so i'm like well where you know i'll, I'll see where the snow line is on it. our world i'll superimpose it on my world and then i know where to put it you know this is and, a perfect uh, use of of you know certain kinds of software to help yep. build the world we have a lot at our disposal to do that, which we didn't have when we were growing up and we were first writing. So it's pretty neat. It's powerful. That's a powerful use of technology for world building. So I love that. And, you know, we're going to swift, swiftly change over to kind of talking more and getting back to books in general and, and but also in, in the things that you love. You've talked a bit about all these different tones and potential age ranges for your fantasy but do you have any favorite sort of subgenres? like you've mentioned obviously we have sword and sorcery are there you know these these stories are interesting for you to tell and what are your favorite subgenres of fan of fantasy yeah you know, when i was a kid michael moorcock was my favorite writer and uh when i was older william gibson was and uh and then i um i was privileged to work with Joe Abercrombie and cool. so uh you know and, and those are all very different and and um I I um you know Star Trek was a huge influence when I was younger oh yeah same and, and uh um and I think Dungeons and Dragons was a huge influence when I was younger and is again and and it it uh but like people are like, you know, I I don't watch a lot of science fiction. Like I never saw Legend with Tom Cruise. I've never seen it. I, my movie tastes don't tend to run that way. Um, you know, my favorite film is Casablanca. My my second favorite film is Mil is Miller's Crossing. Cool. And uh, um, and I I would put Star Trek Six in there on favorite films. But but when I think of like the great films, there 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 are very few of them uh, of my personal list in are science fiction. Or yeah. fantasy, which is um actually that's pretty true for me too. That's interesting. Yeah. Cool. Well, getting into practical pragmatic situations, like what's your typical writing day? Like you your product when you're on, when it's a super productive day, what does that look like for you? How, how what methods do you have? Do you have your coffee or your you know special music? Or how does it work? Lots of coffee, no music. I, I think I can't I, I don't tend to write with music um you know, i've still got two kids at home and two dogs which are, mm -hmm. are being incredibly good right now. they are being good um but but they have built-in clocks they know when it's time for lunch and when it's time for me to play ball and when it's time mm -hmm. for me to you know have a snack and and they get very indignant when when like i'm glad we're doing this at two because if we were doing this at 11 uh, at 11 30 they would be they would just start calling at me it's time to move. it's time to go to have lunch and uh, they're a little bit indignant now because I usually eat and play, you know. Yeah, you know, they're ready to right? play. We get a snack and then we throw a ball. And uh, and they didn't get the ball today because I, I pushed my eating time to back. But uh, I just, uh, I work all the time. I just work all the time. Um, the the first okay. novel, I still had the day job. And so it was written from 11 to 2 a.m. Uh, every night. And then... Wherever you can get it, right? And, it's, and then it's Starbucks on weekends. And... Yeah. Uh, and now I just I, I write all day with breaks for eating and stuff. And uh, but writing now is like also because I do all the lay, uh, layout and art direction and stuff for the for the for the game book. So, you know, a day may wow. just be may not, it, a day may involve just manipulating art and layout and trying to it's like Tetris trying to make things yeah. good. Makes and, sense. Uh, yep. Well, that's a perfect segue into talking about Tales from Stolkey's Hall, which Congratulations. Kickstarter just got fully funded. Funded this morning. 
So let's talk about it. Would you like to tell the audience what it is, what to so expect, what's coming? It is an, an adult. It is an anthology of adult fantasy stories set in Nuremberg, not children's stories. And it is something I've wanted to do since 2012. I, I tried to build in a provision allowing me to do it in my first book contract, and both my agent and my editor didn't know what the hell I was talking about or why <laughs> I would do it. But I, uh, but it's um, it's eleven authors, ten stories, because Clay and Susan Griffith write together, and it's set entirely in Norgard. So it's a short adult short story fantasy anthology based on a role playing game, based on a children's novel. And, you know, I always wanted this world to be big enough that I could scoop out multiple stories for yeah. multiple uh, audiences, you know. Right. And, and like, I mean, if you look at something like Star Wars, I mean, you've got everything in Star Wars from little golden books to Andor. Andor, right. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and quite a range. And, and different audiences are interacting with Star Wars on different levels all the time. Um, and, uh, and that's what I want. I want a world that I can do that with. Yeah. yeah. So this is pushing the whole world into a completely different area. And yeah. also it's inviting people in to write for it, which I, I've had, I've had five other people write for the game, but not for the fiction. So it's a new thing for me. And full disclosure, I am one of the yeah. writers yeah. in this anthology and thank you for Very that. glad to have you. Mm -hmm. So that was a really enriching experience for me. And I, I could see just how magnificently rich your worlds are by working with you as an editor and having to work in another person's universe, which was the first time I've ever done that for media tie-in. And I loved it. You know, I loved the challenge that this isn't my world. This is yours and I'm invited in. So how do I fit that in? So it's a wonderful anthology. And I love that there are so many different kinds of stories in it but all with this magnificent high fantasy setting, epic fantasy and great characters and, and wonderful landscapes and varying tones of stories as I understand it, yeah. Like some of them are perhaps a bit darker than others. Yep, yep. Some so, of them are comedic, some of them are dark. One of them is heartbreaking. Oh, well, yeah. I have not read yet read them all because I have a million arcs to go through that I have to do um, that I promised I would finish. But one of them made the illustrator cry because um, the, the, the I guess we should mention that that there's a there's a regular. Yeah, so I want to talk about the editions. There's a trade edition. There's the trade one. A book book with book like pages. Yeah, looks great. And, uh, this is a proof, but no, actually, this is the final because this <gasps> the, the proof is okay. So this is the final. Until someone catches a typo, this is the final, and uh, and that'll the that'll deliver pretty quickly after the Kickstarter because it's done done, and awesome. then the, the deluxe gamer edition, which will be sized like a role playing game manual. Let me grab. It'll be yeah. Show us one. Yeah, let me grab, grab, grab. So this is not it. This is the original campaign setting, but it'll be yeah, but sized kind of format. More, in that format as compared. Yeah, and with with the matching layout See, to this is what i'm so stoked about i have to have this i want all the editions but this one is like i can't wait let's look at that it's awesome and so it will um it'll be sized to match the role-playing games it'll be full color it'll have the same scroll the design and it'll be illustrated ksenia kazhavnikova is doing chapter illustrations for every story and then there's also additional illustrations in the stories. Great. And uh, and then there's an appendices that will have game mechanics where we've taken monsters and magic items and other things from the stories and turned them into fifth edition game mechanics. So you can take those back and play them in the game. This this really, I was especially stoked by that because yep. something in my story ends up in that appendix as being part of this game that you can play. And I just... I'm geeking out. I love it. So thank you. It just, it's like, I can't wait to get this book. I'm so happy that this is, you know, Kickstarter's done and you still have like three weeks to go. Yep. Yep. And it's, you know, I think everybody's going to love this, the set of tales set in this wonderful fantasy setting. So that brings me to my, so sorry, go ahead. And I was just going to say the gamer edition probably won't ship until November because it's okay. still in the process. Because one of the one of the Kickstarter rewards is is the top tier reward is you could be a character in that that the conceit ah. is Stolke's Hall is a mead hall in the city of Benso, which is the 
southernmost and most open city in Norengard. It's the port city that foreign trade comes through. And so Stolke's is this big, rowdy, famous meat hall. And it it, it factors into the first and second novel. And then um, and then the campaign book has actually a map of Stolke's and some information on Stolke's. And the first adventure for the campaign book takes kicks off in Stolke's. And so Tales from Stolke's Hall is the conceit is it's stories you might hear sitting around in Stolke's. And so in the appendix, and four people have already taken us up on this, one of the top tier rewards is you can be a character and because we're going to get someone, probably Ksenia, to because she's wonderful at it, to draw the the, the backer as a character and then create. I, I love doing, I did this before, where somebody will tell me their name and I'll try and trace it back and turn it into a Norse name. If there's if there is an actual Norse name, we'll use that. If there's not, then we'll figure out what the Nor- name means. Yeah, and how, cool. And how you would have said that in Norse, and so there'll be people in the back of the book listed as either staff members or patrons of Stalkies with a little yeah. write up in their picture as yeah. people who, yeah. So that's still in process. So so that's why the the other book will be a little bit later coming out. Right, great. So when can we expect uh, general orders to go out for the regular trade paperback? September. September. Uh, it's like, it's, it's the first Tuesday in September is when I'm gonna. It's, it'll be available oh that's so great i can't wait till it's out in the world so so now you've got this out in the world what's what's your next big thing or what's your dream writing project what do you got coming well there's there's a whole bunch happening um one is uh cobalt press who i've written for before are doing their own version of a fifth edition role-playing game called tales from the valiant and that's on kickstarter now okay it's closing in on nine hundred thousand dollars and over seven thousand backers and it's it's i don't know how much you know about the ogl controversy with wizards of the coast i know about it but the the, well wizards of the coast for years has had an open game license that allows other people to contribute to their world by making you know dungeon dragons an operating system that other people can write for within certain constraints and in january it leaked they were thinking about getting rid of that and there was a huge uproar. They lost tons of subscribers on D&D Beyond, their website, and the whole community was furious. And it was, people like me who, you know, had been putting this stuff out were faced with the possibility that we might have to take everything down and just shut it off. And they capitulated and they put it out into um, the public domain. And I'm very glad they did, and I appreciate that move. But, you know, there's a... Uh, Monty Cook games of, of uh, Monty Cook of Monty Cook games said at the time, he's like, if someone pointed a gun at your head and it misfired and then they apologized, would you trust them? Mm. So mm-hmm. uh, Cobalt Press has decided to put out their own completely compatible game using the portion of Dungeons and Dragons in the Creative Commons and then workshopping it, adding some things they like and making a, a game that will be fully compatible, but a little bit different kind of a 5.5 or something. And uh, their Kickstarter is going right now. And it's Tales of the Valiant. It's blowing up. Awesome. And the Kickstarter is for a player's guide and a monster book. And um, so they uh, approached, I'm a publishing partner with them, which initially just meant I was committed to publishing things for their system next year, about which more in a minute. Okay. But they approached a, a number of our part of the partners and said, you know, would you guys make uh, PDF only 16 to 32 page adventures that we could do as an add on to the Kickstarter? And so there are nine adventures that are going to be Great. in um, that are part of this add on. It's twenty five dollar add on nine adventures. They're cool. PDF only, and they're all adventures in 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 different people's worlds. Great. So um, mine takes place in Norgard. It'll be the first thing in Norgard written for Tales of the Valiant. And it, uh, I'm actually, I had planned on doing, and this will be a 2024 project. I had planned on starting a whole new storyline in a whole new country. I've got a story in the works called Crisis in Castlebriar, right. which takes place in the Swiss influenced uh, land of Nalinia, the city of Castlebriar, which is in the second book, Nightborn. Yeah. And uh, I mentioned that fake game I ran like years and years ago. Yep. So the full color version of that map will be in the thing. And and it kicks off a whole new storyline, new monsters, new everything. And that was going to be 
my transition to Tales of Valiant. And I was also going to use that occasion to update my look and feel, do a different kind of interior and stuff like That's that. Because awesome. here is Norse. And uh, and then when they said, like, do you want to do uh, a, a, a short thing for us? Um, I didn't, I'm not ready to commit to what the new design is going to be. And, and it would be a lot easier in the short amount of time we have to do something in Norngard with all the stuff I already have. But I do want to tease what's coming. Mm -hmm. So the adventure is going to be called The Banner of the Bull, and it takes place on the border of Norngard and Arland, the Celtic country to yeah. the south. With the and unicorn. What it off is that something has changed in the world, mm -hmm. and now monsters from the Feywild, what my Feywild is called Elsewither, but fairy monsters from Elsewither via coming through Ireland are now pouring into Norengard. So you're confronting things that you that the people of Norengard have no experience with because oh, they're, all, they're all Celtic Fae. And that's going to be uh, a, a kind of a tie-in with the storylines that are coming next year. That's amazing. Yep. And, then, uh, and then I've got the stuff next year, which is Crisis in Castlebriar, which is itself part one of a big storyline. Cool. game game storyline and uh and then i after two years of playing in this i'm gonna do an expanded version that's uh you know this is a this was huge and almost all the art in it is original but there's maybe 20 pieces of because there's hundreds of pieces of art there's maybe 20 pieces of stock art and that drives me nuts yeah so right. i'm replacing all the stock art in a revised edition and I'm adding in and, and the sad thing is is book I was also working on a bestiary with a lot of uh, additional monsters for fifth edition D&D &D, and now that I'm going to be leaving that behind they may not appear in a product so I'm going to stick them back into this book so I want to put out an expanded version that corrects errata adds monsters replaces stock art and and I want to get that out uh, I'm going to do a correct, and I'm going to do a revision on the Sagas of Norgard adventure book. Going to get that out. Uh, I am working with somebody on translating this into uh, some other game systems as well. And eventually I'll probably do a Tales of the Valiant version of it. And um, and then I really want to do a comic book desperately. Oh, yes. And, uh, yep. I don't, I'm just starting to think about comic book. Ooh, that, so that sounds amazing. Yep. This is great. And there's a company that's been very, 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 very slowly nibbling with film interest, but I that's only real when it is real. And it's not real yet. But I have been working with a production company on 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 possibly turning some of this into film. But we'll that's very, 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 very vapor right now. Still pretty exciting. Yeah. Well, congrats on all of it. Just incredible oh, stuff. But that would be the dream. TV series would be the dream. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, it yeah. would. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so there's a lot going on. And uh, and I also have an idea for a horror-themed uh, adventure in Norgard that I'd like to do at some point. Yes, yep. please. Well, and there's plenty of opportunity for that with invading beings yep. and things. So, okay, so I have a dorky question for you and then we'll get to some final questions and wrap it up. But so if you could have the power of any of your characters or beings in your world, which would you most like to have? Ooh, um... Well, that's an interesting question because if you'd ask me like what superhero power I would want, I'd be Wolverine, just because not you know healing all the time would be great. Um, my characters tend to be more human characters with not a lot of power, just a lot of personal character. Um, so, uh, and then the, the monsters are largely undead. I don't want to be one of those. I might have to be a dragon. Um, that's valid. Yeah, I might be a dragon. All right. But, uh, but I'm not a dragon. I know I'm a dwarf. I'm 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 I like making things. I paint, I craft, I 3D print. For the longest time I was in love with dark beer. So I'm I'll 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 just take dwarven constitution. All right. <laughs> okay. Now what's the worst writing advice you've ever received? Uh I think write what you know is horrible advice. <sighs> Isn't it? Isn't yeah. it just? I mean, we wouldn't the, have fantasy novels what, if what's we stuck the point to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, write what you want to know might be better advice. That is good advice. So write what terms, you want to yeah. discover. Yeah. Well, what do you if you 
for writers just starting out, fantasy writer, what's the best writing, writing advice that you could give to them? Well, mine is going to have a Hollywood bent to it. That's fine. Um, one of the things I did for a long time to help me learn pacing was I, because I, I, you know, there's so many writing books. There's so many writing books and they're all just like, uh, get in touch with your inner warrior and follow your bliss. And, you know, I don't know. Not practical. Uh, yeah, they're not practical. They're not practical at all. And then neither are a lot of, 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 of college writing programs. And, and they're only like, you know, Dan Decker's courses and he has a book on anatomy of screenplay, but I think it's that print that was helpful. Um, Matt Bird has a book called the secrets of story, which is again, from a film perspective, but it's very helpful. And that's about it for helpful books. And there's, and, but what I do is what I did for years is I would pick a movie and I would sit down with a notebook or a laptop and I would watch it with the remote in my hand and pause. And I would write down every beat, you know, and a beat for people who don't know is like a single instance of something happening. So like if, if the detective bursts through the door, walks up to his boss, slams his foot on the desk, his fist on the desk, and they have an argument and he walks out, that's like four beats, you know? Yeah, it's all these different steps. Bursts huh? in the door, slams the desk, yells at boss, walks out. And I would write all the beats down in a film and pause it constantly and write down the time. Mm -hmm. And I paying particular attention to what happened at the one quarter mark, the halfway mark, and the three quarter mark. And uh, and then that would give me a sense of pacing for a story. It's like music. And yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And doing that over and over and over again. And uh, um, really, really like I when I used to try and I tried to write spec scripts for Star Trek when I was in Hollywood, and I didn't sell any, but I did get they were good enough that I got invited to pitch regularly. That's great. And um, and I started out doing that with Star Trek. And, and, you know, Star Trek back then had a five act structure, a three minute, three minute prologue, and then five acts of 11 pages each. And the first time I wrote a spec script, it was all over the place. One act was like seven pages and one was 23 <laughs> and fought like crazy. And the last time I wrote one, everyone hit 11 pages exactly because, you know, you immerse yourself in that formula and it, you learn, it becomes intuitive. And so doing that outlining process with film was really, really super helpful for, for, for uh, breaking it, you know, getting this all down. That's brilliant advice, actually. Brilliant. Very cool. Well, yeah. we've talked about a lot of things and to wrap this up, I would love to know if there's anything that I haven't asked that you would like to share with our viewers and Ooh. readers. We did cover a lot. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, it, it, um, no, we talked about what's coming. We talked about what's come before. I think we're good. Well, then let's ask the, the question that I always like to ask is where can readers and listeners find you? And well, there is a Thrones and Bones Facebook page, which is Thrones and Bones, one word. I am still on Twitter at, at Lou Anders, although I don't really do anything there. But there's a link tree on my Twitter account that has everything else. I'm on. There's a Thrones and Bones Discord, oh, wow. which is uh, woefully under underpopulated right now. But I still put Maybe. up. Maybe people will join. And and um and uh, I'm on uh, there's Thrones of Bones Instagram. So it's Lou Anders author on Instagram. I'm pretty spreadable. I'm pretty I'm pretty much everywhere. I'm very Great. easy. Very easy to Google. Great. And uh, yeah, and there's okay. Lou mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much, Lou, for joining us. This has been a wonderful chat. Thank you for having me. Great. Thanks so much, and Ad Astro.